Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Anna. I'm a project assistant at Clean Energy States Alliance. Our webinar today is titled Commissioning an Energy Storage System Lessons Learned in the Field. Uh, the webinar is a presentation of DOE Office of Electricity, uh, the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. STAP is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratories, and Clean Energy States Alliance. Before I pass this over to our wonderful panel of speakers today, I want to go over some logistics with you all. All of our attendees today are in listen-only mode. We have a couple of options to join the audio portion of our webinar today. You can, you can call in via your telephone or use your computer's mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar's console, you can view the presentation in full screen. You can click on the orange arrow. Uh, you can see that circled on your screen right now on the control panel. You can also click on that arrow to expand the webinar console. And one thing you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit your questions and comments. We're aiming to save between 15 and 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Uh, so please type in your questions and your comments when you think of them. Do not wait until the end, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. One final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you um, a re the, the recording of this webinar and other presentation materials, these speakers' uh, presentations, all of that, um, to your email inboxes uh, within, a couple, within a couple days. We will also post all of this material to our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. That's a good URL to know because that's also where we post all of our upcoming webinar information as well as our large archive of STAP webinars from the past uh, 10 years or so. So with that, I will pass this over to my colleague, Todd Olinsky-Paul. He is a senior project director here at Clean Energy States Alliance, and he will be moderating today's webinar. Thanks, Anna. And welcome everybody to another in our series of STEP webinars. This one is on energy storage commissioning, and we have some excellent speakers who can share their experiences from real projects that have been built, commissioned, and are operational or uh, in some advanced state of being becoming operational in the field. I'm going to do a very brief intro to try to leave room for plenty of questions. So. Uh, I will just briefly say Clean Energy States Alliance is a membership organization for state energy agencies. We're a nonprofit located in Vermont. Next slide, please. And among other things, we uh, conduct the STAP program, which is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership under contract to Sandia National Laboratories with generous funding from DOE Office of Electricity. We have Dan Borneo from Sandia and, and Dr. Emery Zhuk today with us uh, from DOE, and I want to welcome and thank them for their support. Next slide, please. I'm going to, again, go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Anna. I'm gonna just briefly introduce everybody. We have longer bios that are being offered as a handout. Uh, there, if you look at your webinar console, it says handout. Uh, you can get the bios there. So I will briefly introduce everyone by name and title to save some time here. Dr. Zhuk is director of the DOE Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program. Dan Borneo is an engineering program project lead at Sandia National Laboratories. Dave Galorowitz, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Dave, is lead engineer at Alliant Energy, uh, a Uti large utility, and Clay Coughlin is CEO of Cordova Electric Cooperative. And these guys are going to uh, be our presenters and walk us through not only the commissioning process, but lessons learned in real projects in the field. I hope you enjoy it. Again, we will get to as many questions as we possibly can. I will now turn the mic over to Dr. Zhuk for introductory remarks. Well, Hello, everybody, and uh, this is our current STEP webinar. When developing a storage project, commissioning is perhaps the most overlooked stage of the work. This is where the glitches are. This is 
when you make sure your system actually works. Your interconnections, your monitoring system, your communication system, your AC, and your fire protection. This is also when you first, your first responders, your local fire department, uh, get a walkthrough. And hopefully, this is a time when thermal issues put in their appearance. Better now than later on. Uh, bad examples have been noticed. It takes time, it takes patience, and most of all, it takes experience. This is where your lessons learned come in handy. It also takes money. You should budget a certain amount of project funding for, the, for this period. So, to understand the importance of commissioning uh, as a stage of your storage project, we have arranged for the, this uh, ESTAB webinar. You will hear from Dan Borneo, who has seen a lot of glitches in his time, and then from two of our projects, one in Iowa and one in Alaska. And both of these projects, by the way, turned out to be successful. Thank you. Okay, thanks very, very much, Dr. Zook. And we'll go to our first speaker, Dan Borneo from Sandia National Laboratories. Good morning, or good afternoon, as it may be. Uh, as Todd said, Dan Borneo from Sandia National Labs, and I believe I have control. Maybe I don't. Do I have control, Anna? You should, Dan, um, if you click and move your mouse on the screen, it should work. No, so it's not working, Anna. So I'll let you, I'll let you drive. Okay. So um, as Emery said, I have a lot of experience. I come from the construction world, uh, joined the, the national labs about 20 years ago now. But uh, so we stay, stay involved. And what you're gonna see from me is more of an overview because uh, we do demonstration projects. Please advance. So as you can see, we do demonstration projects throughout the country. And so we see a lot of energy storage commissioning activities at a higher level. And so we get a, a taste of each one, uh, but you'll hear from Cordova, and Alliant who will give you more details into the uh, nuts and bolts of commissioning. Next slide, please. So when we talk about an energy storage system, um, the schematic is, is on the left-hand side there. The right-hand side, that is actually the Alliant system, but Dave will probably be showing you. And, um, but that's what we're talking about on the left there, the schematic, you got, a, you got your transformer, you got your point of connection to the grid. Uh, you're going through um, the power conversion system, which takes the DC from the battery, transforms it to AC, and then you have your storage device. And the appropriate, um, you see the, the schematic at the bottom, you have um, the BMS, which takes care of the battery, manages the battery, the voltage, the levels, tells the energy management system what, what state of health the battery is in. The energy management system then talks to both the, the site management system or the grid, depending on your configuration, and the inverter that says what the battery can actually produce for the grid. And then the site management system is there in the event that you have to, uh, if you have more than one distributed energy resource, resource, then the site management system connects to all of them and um, it's reading the grid and so it's all communicating together and even though that sounds easy in actuality that is not always easy next slide please so commissioning you know th this is an age-old problem 
we don't really think about commissioning until the system is in. And then once it's in, it's too late to think about commissioning um, because everybody wants to get it up and running. So what I've learned over the years, I come from the semiconductor business where, you know, you might have 3,000, 5,000 pieces of equipment all needed to be tested and, and uh, commissioned before you could go into production. And we learned the hard way. And so through that experience, basically you, you want to start at project initiation and you, there you're looking at how are you, the application you're going to use the system, how you're going to use it, and that will lead to a sequence of operation. Originally, you know, I've been in the battery this battery team for 15 plus years. Originally, we're we're not we weren't not seeing sequence of operation, but we are more and more seeing those as part of the design package, the construction package, and this really helps lead to how you're going to test the system when it's going through commissioning. Um, and then you have your load profiles when you're doing your project development and design. So let me back up a minute. The application is project initiation. Why do you need the system? What are you going to do with it? And then when you get into the design, you're looking at the load profiles. And, and so the load profiles drive the application. The application drives the commissioning activities. And then when you get into the procurement, your RFP process, and excuse me for talking fast, but Todd told me that I, I can't be um, can't be long. So uh, when you get into the proposal, you need to make sure that your RFP outlines your uh, expectations for the contractors to do commissioning. Commissioning plan, you need to have your specifications, your uh, code requirements. Uh, and then when you get into the RFP, when you get into the roles and responsibilities of it, then you need to outline what you expect from your contractor. And then when you get into the construction, well, while they're building all the infrastructure for the system, you, if you can, you want to do as much testing at the factory as you can. And what the problem is with that is you've got a lot of offshore manufacturing, unfortunately, and you have components coming from different parts of the world. And then they meet and marry at the site, which is problematic, but that's just the way it is. And then when you get into the commissioning and back to the RFP process, you want to really drive one owner as, as one owner of the commissioning process. As an owner of the project, the site where you're putting it, you do not want to have the situation, which happens a lot, where you're talking to one guy and he's saying, not my problem, it's the other guy's problem. And then you get that back and forth. And I believe both projects that you're gonna hear from later might use that as a lesson learned. And then um, obviously when you get into the um, operations, you want to get into the collecting the operational data so you can track the performance, the capacity phase, see what's going on. I noticed there are predictive tools, IR scan. Um, I don't know how I say that. I don't know how valuable it is, but it really cannot hurt to do IR scanning after the system is in operation for a little while. So it's kind of burned in, pardon the pun, but um, and then throughout the operation, because then you might notice hot spots. Next slide, please. Back up one. So uh, here's the team. When you're setting up your project, obviously you're the owner, and then you have the design engineer. They're the ones doing the infrastructure, um, making sure that everything is set. So when the battery arrives, it sets on the pad, connect it, and away you go. You should always have your utility involved, have them heavily involved at the very beginning because you have to go through permitting, the interconnection, authorization, uh, the point of connection work, and then you're going to have your site construction, the installer, um, and then a lot of times you have the installer, but the vendor is somebody separate who is providing the batteries to the installer. And your authority having juris jurisdiction, the AHJ, um, I don't have them starred, but they're important because you will have to satisfy their code requirements. And then the system integrator or commissioning agent, 
if you have one, um, hopefully the system integrator and the, the, the installer are one and the same, but we've seen situations where they're not. And then last, but definitely not least, is the fire department. Because if bad things happen, you do not want the fire uh, firemen showing up saying, I never knew this was here. So it's very important that they are brought on board early and throughout the process and then training at the end of the process. Next slide, please. So when you get into your RFP and your design and you're going to issue your specifications, these are the specifications that surround the installation of an energy storage system. Um, so, and I arrow some of the more, more important ones that are really um, biting people right now. You got the NFPA 855, the UL 9540. Those are fairly new, I think within a year, maybe a little bit longer, and they surround the safety and the testing of an energy storage system. And they also have an impact on where you can locate the energy storage system. So um, in other words, if, if, you, you, if you don't have this type of testing, then you have to put your energy storage system further away from any occupied buildings, et cetera. So they're very important. And we actually are working a couple projects where they wanted to install the system next to the building, but they weren't UL 9540 compliant. And it said, no, you can't do that. You have to move it 100 foot away from the building. And <laughs> that causes a problem, especially if you already have the infrastructure, the pad board, the conduits in place, you know where your point of connection is. And then um, the installation and application, the NFPA 70, that's the National Electric Code. And then IEEE 1547 talks about how, how the system should operate. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the accept, just this is just kind of a, a chart of how it all works. Your project development, procurement, construction, commissioning, now, when you get into the commissioning, you got various stages of the commissioning. You got your operational acceptance testing, and that is when you're testing each individual component, right? Does it work? Do your fans work? Do your fire protection systems work? Does your do you have the piping uh, torqued and tested so it's not going to leak if ever there is a a reason to use it? Um, that's another a lesson learned. They didn't do that and something happened, the system charged with water and the pipe started leaking and something was unrelated to the battery, caused problems for the battery. And then you do your startup and that's basically, that's basically turning the switch. And then you do your functional acceptance test and the functional acceptance test is gonna be based on the sequence of operation, which is based on what are you using the system for? What are the applications? And then I have shakedown there. And shakedown is a kind of a special thing. And that's basically, that's when you turn the power off or you try to implement or um, synthesize something bad happening and to see that your system shuts down the way it should shut down and then comes back online the way it should, should come back online. Next slide, please. So uh, I won't go over this, but this is all the various parts of the system that you need to test test out. There are some um, test procedures that Pina and Al and Sandia put together that talks about how you would go about testing these. Uh, next slide, please. So some lessons learned. Uh, interconnection will always take longer than you think. Citing, as I just mentioned about uh, living up to the codes, developing the RFP, the codes and standards, um, the bid analysis, you need to understand who's supplying which component, communications and data acquisition. The data acquisition is kind of important because this system, uh, it, it's, it's, it doesn't make noise, it's pretty silent, and but you need the data acquisition to understand how it's performing and how it's um, performing over time. Is it losing capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And then last but not least, 
cybersecurity of remote monitoring is a growing concern because you know you have all these connections you're online you're on the internet and can people get into it and do bad things next slide please so um as as uh, every said i do have some experience so i've been in this business oh 45 years all the way from electrician installing these things well it wasn't energy storage back then to now uh living in the hollowed halls of uh, a national lab but you know i've seen red hot bolts because we didn't torque uh fell cables because they weren't measured breakers inter inadvertently tripping because they weren't coordinated failures in, in equipment because they were not installed correctly and i want to make a comment on that one commissioning is just not for new systems every time you do a maintenance on a piece of equipment you should always do a abbreviated commissioning on that piece of equipment to make sure that you put it back together correctly um, overheating of systems because we didn't have adequate ventilation uh, water leaks as i mentioned piping connections not tested uh, controls adequate testing procedure making sure you're checking everything because one bit out of sequence in a register could drive you nuts um, applications the sequence of operations is not well thought out commissioning really helps with that because when you go to go through the sequence of operation you'll figure out whether you have a good one or not uh, next slide please so I'm going to hold off on the questions that bother me so but these will come to you with the slides and these are the things that I when, when we are helping people develop RFPs we are making sure these questions are answered uh, next slide please so the conclusion is pay attention to the details that is what commissioning is all about and every failure that I've been involved with and I've been involved with a few is because we were not paying attention. Uh, and so there's some, some available literature out there. You can get to the Sandia website to find that. And uh, some commissioning documents that EPRI and Sandia are putting together right now for year-end release. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you listening. And stay, stay on for a second before we go to Dave from Alliant. There's a question specifically that I, I just wanted to give you a chance to answer quickly. The question is, what is meant by sequence of operation? So a sequence of operation is how your system will work. So in order, to, um, let's, say, let's say you're going to do demand reduction. So you're going to, your sequence of operation will be when the demand reaches a certain point or there's a certain time of day, then my energy storage will come on and my energy storage will stay on for this length of time. And then my energy storage will go off. And so that's just basically step by step, you know, like, like for instance, uh, a, a real ge generic example is your heating system. When the temperature reaches this point, my heater comes on when my temperature reaches a higher point, my, energy, my uh, heater goes off. And so that is a sequence of how your system will operate. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to Dave Galarowitz from Alliant Energy, uh, talking about lessons learned from commissioning the uh, Decora Iowa Energy Storage Project. And I just want to remind folks, if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in because um, we're going to, I'm trying to get these things, the, the questions kind of uh, in some kind of rational order so that when we get to the questions and answers, it all makes sense. Thanks very much. Dave, you're on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this presentation is just covering some of the lessons we've learned around the uh, Decora battery energy storage project in Decorah, Iowa. Uh, next slide. Uh, so first, I just wanted to cover the design really quickly so there's a little bit of common background for what the project is. Next slide. 
for the battery itself, uh, we contracted with uh, NLX, who is the integrator, and the battery is a coordination, coordinated effort between uh, SunGrow, who is the manufacturer of the uh, container and PCS, and Samsung, who is the manufacturer of the batteries and BMS. Uh, it's located in Decorah, Iowa, uh, near a city park. Uh, you have a NMC lithium ion battery. And this battery is primarily focused on uh, increasing hosting capacity. Uh, while the battery does have real power capabilities, uh, that was used in coordination with reactive power capabilities, the way the project was envisioned. Uh, the battery RFP was issued spring 2019, uh, order placed uh, fall 2019. Uh, commissioning was completed in June of 2021. Uh, but it is pending some additional uh, things before the battery can be placed in full service. Um, right now it's pending a field certification and a fire, final fire system testing. Uh, the system is in use right now with a more basic charge discharge sequence and uh, pending the, uh, the lion tamer checkout uh, certification and a, a direct transfer trip controls, the load will be increased. But right now it does have uh, reactive power compensation and uh, real power operation. Next slide. Uh, there are then a couple of pictures uh, of, uh, of the site without going into too much detail. You have the uh, screening for the public and a little bit of information about what the uh, Decora battery project is. And then on the right, a slide showing uh, some of the module installation. Uh, that was done in the field. That's definitely something that we learned was uh, not a preferred way and was a bigger challenge when commissioning the project. Next slide. Now I wanted to cover just some highlights around the commissioning without really spending a lot of time going into detail just due to time constraints on the presentation. Next slide. Uh, the One of the biggest limitations that we ran into was uh, certification of the, the container. Uh, the container ultimately wasn't certified for uh, ingress. And we had worked with the integrator to get field certification. And uh, certification also required some uh, additional labeling of devices uh, and the container. Uh, it was really surprising to find out how long some of the field certification is. Uh, in particular, we had worked with uh, TUV for certification and there's significant lead times for scheduling the inspectors and we had to move on pretty short notice to try to get uh, an initial inspection, uh, which did highlight some issues. So uh, we are working through uh, issues noted with uh, water ingress and that'll, that's working through the, uh, the container provider. And uh, certainly for that, since then, we've seen a lot better certifications that are available on containers and better installations right at the RFP phase. Uh, you know, this is one of the downsides if that certification is not available in advance. Next slide. Uh, there are some limitations that the equipment has, which uh, really weren't really known in advance. And that's part of the reason that these are pilot projects. One of them was that the uh, DC contactors would open and close really frequently when there's a, uh, a zero set point for the battery. And in order to really minimize that, we, in we initiated a more regular charge discharge cycle that'll keep the DC contactors from unnecessary cycling. Uh, lifetime on those DC contactors, at least for the installation we have, uh, been highlighted as a major issue. Uh, also, we've encountered frequent battery fan failures, uh, and those have been replaced. We identify most of those as a cycling related concern, or sorry, uh, most of the uh, battery fan failures are module related, which we interpret as a uh, early life cycle failure. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, had noted from a previous installation was animal ingress. This was an issue in a previous project and it led to design changes in the current project. And there haven't been any issues that we've noticed with those, with animal ingress in this installation. 
Uh, and also, and this is related to the uh, DC contactors, uh, we've seen issues with automated alarms or uh, alarms being not caught by our monitoring company immediately. And part of the issue is that if the battery is in standby operation, uh, essentially the equipment is not in service because the contactors aren't closed. And by having a non-zero power set point, we're able to then monitor the system availability on a continual basis. Next slide. Uh, highlighting some site commissioning improvements that we have after seeing the system in operation. Uh, one of the really important things is that the EMS should be able to issue reset commands to the BMS and PCS remotely, at, at least as much as allowed by the BMS manufacturer and PCS manufacturer. Uh, we've seen a number of occasions where site personnel have had to visit the site in order to uh, restore the system to service after a blink or outage on the switchgear or feeder breaker trip. Um, then we would also recommend coordinating with EMS manufacturer, again, where possible to integrate any aftermarket off-gas detection systems rather than uh, rely on an integrator and in-house uh, technical expertise. And then uh, it seems obvious, but it's really important to verify the connectivity and system functionality in advance of system performance testing. Instead of just checking that the system looks like it's available, running it through its paces in advance of system performance testing just to make sure things don't trip and so much as you can control it in advance of testing. Next slide. And then some additional site commissioning improvements. Uh, this one that was mentioned uh, earlier by Dan, uh, that there really should be more operational processes identified at the start where you do want to check those out as part of commissioning. And instead of just it being a capacity test and communication for the system, there should be the ability to test out a starting the system from it being offline, stopping the system to that offline state, uh, alarm resets, and then set point tracking, and have all of those be spelled out really specifically uh, in the commissioning process and specify more to the integrator than rely on the integrator putting together their own package that covers all of your needs. And this goes to also the concern about the wrong registers. Uh, testing the alarms from the field all the way through to the SCADA system is really important. And again, so much as you can do that because some of these are internal alarms to the BMS and those might be difficult to simulate. Uh, as progress goes on, we'll have, I'm sure, more things to add to this list, but I think that covers some of the major highlights for challenges with commissioning. And I'll Take any questions either now or at the in the session at the end. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we will just go right on to Clay Copland from Cordova Electric. Clay, you're up. All right, thank you. So, um, I apologize for not having video. I'm on a ferry midway across Prince William Sound. Wishing that we had a better energy storage system on the boat, uh, saving some fuel and making our system a little more sustainable here in Alaska. Uh, this is an aerial view of the community of Cordova, Alaska. Uh, next slide, please. And so from this map, you can see uh, we're not connected by road system or by electric grid to the rest of the uh, Alaska grid. So this blue horseshoe that circles through town is our entire grid. In the upper left and upper right hand corners, you see our two run of the river hydroelectric projects. Uh, they're a wonderful resource and they provide 70% of our community's energy, um, pretty much 100% in the summer, but then in the winter, as the rivers freeze up and we run out of um, water, we have to supplement with diesel. So when we're 100% hydro, we used to balance our grid by operating deflectors and deflecting about 750 kilowatts of hydro capacity. Um, well, that was extremely expensive and a waste of renewable energy. And so we uh, evaluated several, uh, next slides, please. I should say in, in partnership and with the sponsorship of uh, Dr. Zhuk at um, the Office of Energy Storage, um, we had a very rich data set, 20 years of one second resolution data 
uh, on our grid. So we were able to draw from that operating data to right size, model our battery, and uh, select the, uh, the best technical choice for short duration energy storage, which was a lithium ion battery energy storage system, and then install it on our grid. So uh, on the front end of the procurement and uh, specification of our unit, we work with Sandia National Labs, also the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association and the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. We got templates for uh, other battery energy storage systems that had been purchased and we tweaked those, modified them to suit our needs and then we shared them back um, for technology transfer for others that um, wanted to particularly make a battery energy storage installation on a microgrid um, in kind of an advanced use case where they're going to be balancing their whole um, grid with the battery energy storage system. So the last bullet here is, is really, really essential, and it's having a meeting of the minds with your vendor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in another slide here. So we started our commissioning planning um, well before we even purchased the unit. Uh, we really developed our use case. We were so concerned that if we're relying on a battery energy storage system to balance our grid, and, and by the way, all of our lines are underground, and we have extremely reliable uh, grid electricity for our seafood processing industry in the summer in particular. So we did not want to denigrate or lose any reliability. And that means that if you're relying on an energy storage system to balance your grid 24 seven, um, even the simplest communications failure can result in a, a power outage when you lose your frequency control. So we were hyper uh, concerned and hyper vigilant in really mapping out uh, our use cases, all the operating modes, how, um, how it would interface with our SCADA system and, and play nicely with each other. And in this graphic, you can see, make sure that the battery it has rock solid communications and controls with the energy converter system, this um, ABB Hitachi uh, PCS100, and then that it interfaces um, in a very robust way with our SCADA system and uh, maps out all the use cases. Um, Chloe, well, I think slide, you please. need to advance your slides or on a I think you've gone a, a bit ahead of your slides. I, I did, please advance the slide there. So this is showing the graphic where our battery uh, module handshakes with our PCS and our SCADA system. So uh, next slide, please. To give you an idea of the intensity uh, that we used in mapping out our use case and all the operating modes and everything, anything and everything about the architecture of the battery itself, its electronics, the inverter, and how it interfaced with our SCADA system. This whole page of notes is one of about five pages of commissioning notes. Again, we developed a lot of those before we even installed the system. Um, next slide, please. So the meeting of the minds was critical. Um, and just simple things like communicating that on a microgrid, with a, a total peak demand of nine megawatts, you can only source so much fault current. Uh, it's not an infinite bus, it's not an infinite grid. It has real physical limitations and challenges and power quality uh, concerns. So um, we had a very highly evolved use case envisioned, um, but we also wanted full flexibility to fully deploy uh, potential other use cases and grid services. So we met with our vendors um, for about three hours, real intense Q&A, and really over the course of two days in Cordoba, uh, showing them the SCADA system, walking through the entire, by, by the point that we met, we actually had their input output maps and had gone through and really pushed on all their operating modes. We got a couple of their real long tenured experts, uh, Jim McDowell with SAFT, um, Anders Stewart, Benny Nyborg here from ABB, and um, I really mapped out any potential difficulties. Uh, next slide, please. 
These are some uh, pictures. We can scroll through these fairly quickly. Um, this is uh, site work. Uh, and it's just to show you the level of kind of detail that we had to go through in preparation for the commissioning and, and the crazy short timeline that we had. The battery energy storage system hit the ground in May and we actually had it fully commissioned by July. In fact, uh, some of the commissioning staff said that that just never happened and they um, really uh, didn't expect to be there and made other plans for some of that timing, but we really executed well. Uh, next slide, please. And these are just some details, uh, cleaning out gutters, putting new uh, lids on trenches. Uh, next slide, please. Um, installing a new ground loop in the middle picture, uh, extending our grounding grid. We tested our grounding and I uh, wanted to make sure that we had a really solid ground plane. We had to add a recloser in another section of bus in the substation. Um, next slide, please. Partly due to uh, poor grounding systems, we decided to um, drive pilings. So um, this is working with local contractors to install the pilings for our system to rest on. Next slide, please. So this is where I would get into a little bit of the prep on commissioning. Our staff at Cordova Electric are um, maintenance operators. So they did all of the commissioning on our side, landed all the wires, um, performed all the testing, went through the preventative maintenance training, and they're actually the operators who are gonna be operating the system. So we were very fortunate in that there was, there was literally no layers between Cordova Electric and the vendors. Uh, so no reason not to have our own employees as involved in, in the commissioning and, and really executing all of the commissioning because they're gonna be the ones that are operating the system and they understand the architecture, the IO, the mapping. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is just showing the grounding connections where we bonded to the pilings to pick up uh, extra ground reference in the container. Uh, next slide, please. And here you can see we've got one ABB staff and four, all four CEC employees uh, involved with the uh, commissioning there. So our package um, we purchased as a pre-certified uh, containerized unit. So both the PCS uh, from Hitachi ABB and the SAFT module were rated. They had all the fire systems. Everything was pre-installed. It was uh, built in Florida, assembled, and it was delivered fully compliant for access and so forth. Um, this greatly accelerated our on-the-ground commissioning. We live in a coastal rainforest with 140, 150 mile an hour winds frequently, 150 inches of annual precipitation. So uh, we did not, that, that weather can be happening while you're commissioning. We wanted to um, have as much of the package built remotely and then arrive on site ready to land our control wires and so forth. So, um, Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of the timelines and outcomes, um, in 2007, when our system started peaking, we realized we needed battery energy storage to fully leverage our hydro and save diesel fuel. Uh, it was in 2012 that we kind of started realizing energy storage to balance our grid was a good solution. And the Alaska Center for Energy and Power uh, approached Dr. Zhuk in 2015-16 um, and then over the course of a couple of years of modeling and analysis, uh, we ultimately ordered our battery energy storage system in 2018. That arrived in May of 2019. We had it fully commissioned on the ground in July. And then we operated it manually for several months to work all the bugs out. And then on Thanksgiving week 2019, we put it in full automate, automated operation. Uh, 2021 saved us 50,000 gallons of diesel fuel directly and then freed up enough hydro, hydro to save another 15,000 gallons with our electric boiler. And we've since made gains on those. Uh, next slide. So we we celebrated our success. We actually had a, our ribbon cutting during the commissioning. Uh, next slide. Um, so here is our takeaways. Um, 
conducting that meeting, the Mayans, in, in documenting all the functional items um, at the outset is important. Document those and save them. Um, some of the staff can on those teams can change over time, um, and you want to make sure that you capture those and understand the eco ecosystem where you're going to be installing and commissioning. And in our case, it made sense to do as much of the um, commissioning and handshaking between the inverter and battery system offsite, and then deliver it kind of ready to plug and play as close as you can get. Um, also, make sure your vendors are closing the communication gap between the sales staff uh, and engineers you meet on the front end, and then their field installing crews. Uh, there were quite a few question marks uh, on the ground, and the field crews uh, are like, they told you we could do what? Um, but we had been in constant communication through the project and, and were able to anticipate and head off some of those uh, challenges. Um, we, we did have some challenges. The details really matter. Um, when you're balancing a grid, the bumpless switching between the different modes of operation, it still isn't truly bumpless, uh, but it's, it's adequate and functional. Um, it turns out that when you switch modes, uh, you have to pretty much power down and power back up very quickly, and that, that doesn't work when you're balancing frequency. But um, communications, handshaking, uh, we absolutely insisted on Modbus RTU for our control signals. So when we're telling the battery to manually block load 200 kW, or if we want to balance our grid's power factor, which we've we've done, uh, we can tell it to source 100 VARs, then 200 K VAR, then 300 K VAR until our power factor is balanced. Um, it uh, we want those control signals to be absolutely robust, and we don't want a 30 or 40 dollar um, switch switch or modem to fail. So we had serial connections for our communications commands, and then we used the Modbus TCIP for um, all the alarms and, and general data flow that weren't as critical. Um, so uh, that was an architecture that kind of got lost in translation. We had to kind of quick order and replace one. Um, the alarms, there are a host of alarms that really aren't meaningful to an operator. We really need to know when something's broken or when uh, it's about to fail or if it's too hot or too cold, all the internal alarms, unfortunately, sometimes get lumped together with uh, meaningful alarms. So it took quite some time to separate the wheat from the chaff and make sure that our SCADA system was only getting the critical alarms we needed. Uh, I would just say on the, on the tail end, and to Dan's point about kind of after commissioning or doing work afterwards, um, the preventative maintenance and warranties are an important package and it's really care, uh, important to understand what you are and aren't getting and what the value is and, and how much you really need that. Uh, that's that's actually still a work in progress in the Alaska ecosystem amongst about 10 owners in the uh, battery energy storage space. So um, that's what I had in next slide. Uh, I'd be glad to take any questions on the end here. Great, thank you so much. And uh, we will, we have some questions. We may actually have enough time to accommodate a couple more. So if you have a thought or a question and you haven't typed it into the web to the uh, question box in the webinar console, do that now and maybe we can get to it. Um, can I ask everybody to turn your cameras back on since we are going to have questions and answers and discussion. Uh, Clay, we, we realize that you're not going to be turning on your camera as you are on a phone right now. But if I get everybody else on screen. Hey, Todd. Uh, yes. Before you get into the question, I just wanted to make one comment that uh, uh, Clay brought to light. When you're doing these projects, the owner involvement is like really, really important. Because if you're, if you, if you're lucky enough to have a maintenance staff and they're involved with the project from the get go, and then once it comes time to hand the keys over to them and they are operating it, it's going to be much easier for them to take care of the system if they know how it was built. Great. And actually, that brings up a, 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 a something I wanted to just briefly mention, which 
I don't recall, Dan, whether you mentioned it in your presentation, but uh, Sandia and DOE have produced an energy storage handbook that has a whole chapter on commissioning. And if you haven't seen that, you can go and get it uh, from the Sandia website, download it. It has a lot of great information about commissioning and other aspects of energy storage. And if, and if they stay tuned, uh, Sandia is working with EPRI to, to update that. The one you're referring to is a little bit outdated. And we are going through now and developing a little bit more comprehensive one. Should be out at by the end of the year, hopefully. Yeah, that you're talking about this year's, and I and there are chapters online already. So you can actually find, I believe, the commissioning chapter may be up already. In any case, parts of it I think are still in development. Uh, okay, questions. Dave, you captured a lot of interest with your mention of animals getting into the container. People want to know <laughs> what uh, what kind of animals were getting in and what were they doing? And, and you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, for the issues that we ran in previously, uh, best we could tell, uh, looks like it would have been a squirrel and nesting um inside a different installation and uh, you have i think more likely it would have been more, more winter weather related where it was a a nice warm place to to get into and uh, yeah that was the, the main issue we had in the southwest yeah. it takes and that was uh, mean, uh, actually mean, a actually I was going to say that was a, a big point of focus actually for uh, some of the other installations as well, primarily around uh, the communications and power cabling coming in, that both we uh, kept them secure from really any any small gaps and even kept them secure just during commissioning. That was a, a big priority to make sure that nothing could get in there at any point in time. And squirrels will eat cable, which is not good for the system. Yes. I think I, I, I looked into uh, power outages at, at, at a couple different times over the past few years and looking at causes and rates of outages and squirrels are right up there uh, with, with major storms, major storms and squirrels. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Clay, what are your thoughts on scheduling a follow-up on site vendor visit to train and answer questions? There we go. Um, so we have a preventative maintenance package in place, and there are six month uh, PMs and there are 12 month PMs. And what we've done, in fact, we're in negotiations right now with our battery vendor to kind of change the weighting so that we do more of the work as a utility and have the on sites um, a little less frequently. But um, we have had. All the operators in that picture are now replaced with new operators. <laughs> Not unusual in, uh, to have a lot of human resources turnover these days. So we use those annual preventative maintenance uh, as training opportunities. And um, I think we might have launched we you there. are developing a new preventative maintenance program now. Um, in partnership with a vendor here. Oh, okay. We, there, can you, you hear you me? Came, yeah, you came back at the end there. Okay, I, I muted and unmuted again. Anyway, we've institutionalized our maintenance in a uh, software package that's tied to our SCADA system. Um, we're just testing that now, and it will notify us on regular required maintenance. But most of our maintenance has happened. Um, and a few instances where we've had failures, uh, we've just gotten the replacement parts from the vendor. Uh, we are having them bring them up on the next PM schedule, but we are um, going to get training on actually installing some of the replacement parts so that uh, in the future we can just have them shipped to us and, and do the repairs and preventative maintenance in-house. Okay. Thank you. Dan, question for you. What about site planning for future expansion? Uh, 
Um, well, you know, everything. So yeah, it's a good idea. Bottom line, that's a good idea because you never know where it's going to go. And though the problem will be is some, um, it maybe the energy storage system won't be easily expandable. Like you just can't add on to it. So you'll be adding a new one. So you're basically going to be starting over again. And it doesn't always have to be right next to the old one. Even though it's connected to the same grid, it could be another location on your site. If, if you have room on your site, that is. I don't know if that answers the question or not, Todd. It, 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 it's, it's an answer to the question. If anybody wants to jump in with another expanded answer, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, question for Dave. Can you expand on the non-zero power set point to minimize open close on the DC contactors? Where, where about did you make the set points and was this a DC DC converter? Uh, so the set point here is being uh, provided by our uh, third party who's has main control of the battery. Uh, we do have some control. There's some indications that go to SCADA, but not active control through SCADA. So the type of real power controls that we've implemented go to at the EMS level and they'll follow a profile that'll ensure that uh, the battery will be either charging or discharging. And for a substantial amount of time, it'll just be at a very, very low power level. That'll just be high enough to uh, keep the DC contactors closed. Okay. Uh, this, I guess, is for anybody. How much pre-certification does, does the system go through before being built in the field? Say, Todd, if I could uh, start there. And I'm going to also answer your last question about siting a little bit because it's related. Um, I think our fire codes in Alaska require a minimum of a 50-foot radius. And I uh, developed a 100-foot radius uh, from the nearest point on our energy storage system to the nearest um, occupancy, uh, including our facility that should just have employees working in during the daytime. That gives us a little bit of cushion, but also gives us some great fire safety. Um, our fire safety codes, I didn't brush on this, ended up being one of the bigger challenges. I still never really got an answer as to whether or not the battery energy storage system on an electric utilities property um, was even jurisdictional. Uh, none of our other electrical equipment is, and it comes with its own ha hazards. But I just uh, adopted a compliance path. Um, as Dave mentioned, the lead times are ferocious. Um, six to nine months just to get a fire uh, marshal's um, uh, approval with, without even a, a site visit necessary. So I really went overboard in uh, documenting everything, uh, referencing all the codes and putting tabs in it, sending them a whole binder, uh, providing every single thing they asked for, um, and but making it very accessible and an easy read so that they could see the information right there and that that helped expedite the review but um you really want to start that um the code compliance and fire safety uh work way way early in the process yeah to add to that it, it should be in your specifications that you provide as your construction package uh for instance the 9540 or the 855 one of the two dictates that you have to be 100 foot away from an occupied build building, depending on there's some some caveats to that. And if you don't know that up front, then it could be a real problem. And so and, to answer the question, oh, go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead. I think you're going to answer it now, Clay. I was just going to say, uh, so we took, went to great lengths to make sure everything was pre-certified. It was it was actually stamped by PE in Florida. They tested the system on site. We tested it on site. We test it annually. Uh, we disconnect the solenoid on the actual, um, 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 I'll call it halon, but the uh, uh, fire suppressant, and 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 test and make sure that's operational. But uh, so we pre-certified everything to the extent we could, but that still wasn't acceptable. We also had to get the local certification. 
and another angle to that is the factory acceptance test. If you're talking about the actual energy storage system, if it's ideal, it never really happens, but it's ideal to go to some vendor site and have them have everything there connected and you run it through that sequence of operations that says, how should it operate? So given certain inputs, we should see certain outputs and you do all that in the in the beauty, you know, in the luxury of a factory floor rather than out in the field, especially like in Alaska where, you know, it might be a mud puddle or a snowstorm. Okay. We have a couple of questions that have to do with battery chemistry types. Uh, one person says, were these all lithium ion batteries? Another person says, some of the lessons learned are for NMC batteries. Are all these applicable to LFP? Any additional lessons learned for LFP? So I guess the question generally is, do, are there commissioning uh, points that you need to be aware of for different battery chemistries, or is all this stuff pretty well generalizable across different kinds of batteries? So, so I'll take the first crack at that. So these two projects were lithium ion. Uh, as of right now, there is no separation between an NMC or a, a iron phosphate or lithium titanate. Any of the, the lithium ion batteries would go through the same process. Now, when you go into the flow battery, say, um, that would have additional steps, pretty much the same, but you know, you're, now you've got some pumps you have to worry about. You have some venting that you need to worry about. And so you would basically add on to it. On the other hand, you don't have to worry so much about footprint because you don't uh, you don't have fire safety. From the okay. project perspective, there really wasn't any separate consideration taken based on whether it was uh, LFP or NMC. Uh, from like the third party off gassing detection to uh, the approach we took as for 855 compliance, uh, they're they're very similar. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they make a di this uh, distinction in the codes between the different chemistries of lithium ion. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to leave it here. We're a little bit past three o'clock on the East Coast, um, and we need to wrap it up. Thank you so much to our presenters. And uh, Anna, if you have any final information, this would be the time. Thanks, Todd. I do not have too much. Our next webinar is hosted on September 14th. It's going to work uh, focus on solar for manufactured homes. I don't have a slide available for that, but you can go to our website, lisa.org backslash webinars to find out more information about that webinar. We also have some additional ones in development, which will pop up on that website soon. Again, thank you so much to all of our attendees today and especially to our panelists and our moderator, Todd. Um, this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you for um, joining us for all of this. Again, thank you great. so much and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Anna. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.